Shall we dismiss the children? Is it time for them to head out? Yeah, good. I see the wistful look on some of your faces as they're leaving. I, I understand. You think it's more fun where they're going than it'll be in here, but that's okay. Thanks for being here this morning, and uh, Sam, thanks for rolling with the punches. Basic premise of ministry that I learned early on is that nothing in the world is more subject to demon possession than electronic and computer equipment. <clears throat> Amen, yes, I, I heard that testimony. Just a couple of quick words regarding uh, scheduling. <clears throat> In two weeks, we will begin a series of messages related to uh, the Ten Commandments. On that same Sunday, two weeks from today, we'll start an evening Bible study uh, at 5 o'clock, uh, and I'll be leading that study in the Epistle of James. Uh, then on Wednesday nights, I believe there's going to be a men's discipleship group uh, led by Keith, and then a woman's discipleship group, and I'm not sure who's leading that, but one for each gender, so please know that you'll have a place uh, and that, that you will belong. Next week, I will be out of pulpit, but you will be privileged to hear Dr. Jordan Villanueva. Uh, I think maybe for the first time. Will this be the first time you've preached here, Jordan? Um, you will love it. In fact, you may want to fire me and hire him, and that's okay. It, it'll, be, it'll be all right. But uh, pray for him as he prepares for next week. But you are in for a special treat, and we appreciate the professor's willingness to, to step in. Dwayne and I are going to see my youngest daughter in San Antonio, her husband, her family, uh, over the Labor Day weekend. They're government workers, and uh, they have a little bit of extra time. And uh, so we're going to go and spend some time with them uh, in San Antonio. Dwayne sends her love, uh, recovering very well from surgery, uh, and um, just wants you to know that as soon as she is able to return, uh, she, she will be back. I invite you to turn with me uh, this morning to a little prophetic book in the Old Testament called Hosea. It's right after Daniel, right before Joel, <clears throat> if that helps you. It's a fascinating story, and, and I have to tell you that uh, Hosea, um, I, my seminary degree, my terminal degree at seminary, um, oh, and by the way, I wanted to say... It's so good to have the Bicknells with us today. I think they typically are uh, doing work in uh, another congregation. Bob and I, as well as Paul Butler and I, could tell you more about Southern Association of Colleges and Schools in Atlanta, Georgia, um, which is Orwell's rough equivalent of Big Brother. Uh, we could tell you more about Southern Association of Colleges and Schools regarding faith-based private education than you would ever want to know. Isn't that right, Butler? Yes, sir. Isn't that right, Bob? At any rate, it's, it's, it was fun, uh, and, and it's also a great time to be retired. Amen? That's right. It's good. Hosea is one of my favorite prophetic books because it has about it a tenderness that is truly unique. And it speaks to the reality of our human journey because the man Hosea experience some of the most serious and difficult and challenging dynamics that you can know in life. Specifically as related to his wife, a woman whose name was Gomer. <clears throat> so we're going to read two passages this morning. First of all, from the first chapter, uh, verses 2 through 9, as, as God gives Hosea instruction regarding this relationship. And then we'll turn over to chapter 3 and pick up the story at a later time, uh, and we'll have just a few comments about that intervening period uh, as we move through this morning's message. But first of all, Hosea 1, beginning in verse number 2, uh, we'll read through verse 9. I'll, I'll be sharing from the New International Version of the Bible. If you're able and, and willing, uh, I invite you to stand with me in honor of the reading of the Scripture. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 2, Hosea. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go take to yourself an adulteress. 
an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery in departing from the Lord. So Hosea married Gomer, daughter of Deblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. Verse 6, Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Loruhamah, for I will no longer show love to the house of Israel that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to the house of Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but by the Lord their God. Verse 8, after she had weaned Lorahama, Gomer had another son, and then the Lord said, Call him Lo-Ami, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. In the intervening period between chapter 1 and chapter 3, Gomer evidently deserts the home, leaves the family. And chapter 3 has God's word to Hosea regarding his adulterous wife. So read the entire chapter. It's, it's uh, only about five verses or so. Then the Lord said to me, Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Lover is the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about a homer and a lithic of barley. And then I told her, you are to live in me many days. You must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man, and I will live with you. For the Israelites will live many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred stones, without ephod or idol, and afterward, the Israelites will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. Pray with me. Father, your love changes us. We acknowledge that openly and honestly to you today. It changes us, Father, in dramatic and miraculous ways. Help us to understand its depth as we look at this passage of Scripture together. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts and our minds be pleasing and acceptable to you. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. <clears throat> Consider with me this morning the life of a young man. Scripture seems to indicate to us that, Gom uh, that Hosea came from a family perhaps of some standing and prominence. In all likelihood, Hosea himself was relatively highly educated in terms of Jewish tradition and customs. In many ways, Hosea was a young man whose life seemed to indicate that the sky was the limit. Endless possibilities. Endless potential. Truly blessed and gifted in so many ways. Then there came to Hosea this invasion of the call of Yahweh God. You are to serve me. You are to be my voice in the midst of your people of the northern kingdom of Israel and in the city of Samaria. You are to speak for me. And as a result of your call to ministry, there's something I want you to do. I want you to marry a woman. Scholars have kind of asked the question, did Hosea know when he married Gomer that she would be unfaithful? Um, my own assumption is probably not. The first chapter of Hosea is a historical reflection. And, and so as Hosea reflects back over his life, he said, though I may not have known it at the time, I actually was going to marry a person who would eventually break my heart. And so Hosea and Gomer are married. And 
In Old Testament days, the naming of a child carried with it great significance. Uh, so, for example, if you talk about Esau and Jacob, Jacob was given his name because he was a heel holder, the second born of the twins. And the word Jacob literally means a trickster, a, a person who, who tries to get ahead by deception and by trickery. When Gomer gave birth to the children that she bore, Hosea gave them a name that was intended to communicate a specific part of the message that he was called to proclaim. The first child was named Jezreel. It was a reflection of, a, of, of an event in, in Israel's history in the valley of Jezreel when Jehu came through and in, in a murderous rampage literally slaughtered hundreds and hundreds of people. It was one of those events that would live in infamy. <clears throat> and God said, I am going to punish the northern kingdom of Israel for the sins of Jehu. So when you hear the name Jezreel, you will realize that judgment is coming. Then another child is born, and the name has always been beautiful to me, Lo Ruhamah. But the word in, in the original language actually means unloved. For God is no longer going to love the northern kingdom of Israel. But I have the feeling that in the naming of this child, there is uh, something of an autobiographical journey on the part of the prophet Hosea. I think he is beginning to sense that his wife's affections are not exclusively reserved for him. That she in her heart and in her mind and in her spirit is in the process of beginning to turn away from him. And so out of the experience of his own life of sensing that maybe his wife doesn't love him as deeply as he had originally believed, he names the second child a girl unloved. And then the last child is named Lo Ami, not mine. Not only was that a word from Yahweh to the northern kingdom of Israel, you are no longer my people. I can no longer claim you. You no longer have any fidelity or loyalty or love for me, therefore I reject you. But I think the name of this baby also indicated Hosea's own experience and understanding that in all likelihood this child was not his. Not mine. I like to think in my own mind about Hosea's experience. And I like to kind of put myself in the scenes of his life as an observer. One day, Hosea comes home from preaching in the streets of Samaria. And when he enters his little house, he immediately understands that something is wrong. The children are crying. Gomer is nowhere to be seen. A neighbor woman who cares very deeply for Jose and his family is there. She looked at him for just a moment, and then in embarrassment, her eyes turned to the sides. She said, Hosea, I have fed your children with mine, but I had to bring them home so you could put them to bed and allow them to sleep. And I think Hosea's first question is, where is their mother? Where's Gomer? And then I fancy that the neighbor woman, perhaps holding on to the edge of her garment, was kind of fiddling with it nervously. And she probably said something like this, Oh, I don't want to tell you, Hosea. I mean, you're a man of God, and you're doing the work of the Lord, but earlier today she dressed in her finest dress. She bathed herself in perfume and she met her lover at the foot of the hill, and they walked off hand in hand together into the city. I don't know where she is, but I have a sneaking suspicion I know what she's doing. And I can see Hosea falling across the table in the brokenness of the moment. His own spirit, his own heart, his, his own love, broken. And fascinatingly enough, 
In that moment, perhaps more clearly than ever before, I believe Hosea heard the voice of God. You're hurting, Hosea. But in your pain, I want you to learn something. Because I want to teach you. And as you learn the lesson that I want to teach you, I want you to teach the children of Israel, the citizens of the northern kingdom, the inhabitants of Samaria, I want you to teach them the same lessons that you're in the process of learning. What are the lessons Hosea might teach us today? Well, let me mention three. <clears throat> For one thing, I think Hosea teaches us that we need to understand, we need to learn what sin really is. We so often equate it with breaking a rule or disobeying the law. It, it, we also identify it as, as sort of surrendering to, to selfish pride. It, it's all of that, but, but it's much more. In fact, even more significantly, sin is something that breaks the tender bond of love that God wants to establish with his children. More than simply disobeying a rule, more than simply disregarding the purposes and the plan of God, sin breaks God's heart. Think about the stories in Scripture that, that illustrate that. I mean, Israel is a classic example. That's what Hosea was called to do, to preach to a wayward nation, an adulterous nation, uh, a nation that had betrayed the faith and the love and, and the destiny that Yahweh had designed for them. Israel had done more than step across a boundary line. Israel, Israel had broken the very heart of God. Think about the prodigal of the parable son told for us in Luke's gospel. A boy came to his father and said, Father, I want my share of the inheritance. And then went away and wasted his life in riotous living. Think of how brokenhearted the father was. Think of how the betrayal of the son disrupted the father's life and helped him to understand that to the son, the father's love was no more very precious or important. Or think about in the 21st chapter of John's Gospel, and, and we made reference to this last week, as, as uh, after his uh, crucifixion and then after his resurrection, Jesus encounters Simon Peter, and three times he asks him the same question, Simon, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? And each time, I think with greater seriousness and with greater pain, Peter answered, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, you know I, I love you. It was a painful and a difficult conversation. But that's the way broken relationships unfold. When you betray someone you love, the conversation is always difficult. It's always painful. It's always breaking in its reality. The point I think that Hosea learned and the point we need to understand is that if we view sin simply as, as stepping across a line that God has arbitrarily drawn in the sand, we miss the real significance of the act. Sin breaks God's heart. No way around it. It is a betrayal of the tender bond of love. It is a disruption of the relationship that God wants more than anything else to have with those of us who are his children, who have placed our faith in Christ, who have, who have believed in him. That's what Hosea had to learn. It's not just about disobeying rules, it's about breaking God's heart. But we also need to learn from this, from this story, I think, about the forgiveness that God offers to us. In chapter 3, Hosea is instructed to go and to get Gomer out of basically slavery because 
the price he paid was the price you would pay for a slave. But the underlying message was even more important. I don't want you just to buy her back, Hosea. I want you to forgive her. I want you to love her. The forgiveness of God is one of those things that's really difficult for us to kind of get our head around because it seems so contrary to the experiences that we have as human beings. When someone hurts me, a wall comes down. But God is willing to break that wall down, a wall created by our own transgression, a wall created by our own betrayal. He's willing to forgive us in spite of the fact that we have been openly faithless. C.S. Lewis talks about this in his book, The Problem of Pain. He said, it, you know, it's a poor thing when you think about it to strike our colors to God when our ship is going down under us. a poor thing to come to him as a last resort, to offer up our own when that own is no longer worth keeping. If, if God were proud, he would hardly have us on such terms, but he's not proud. He stoops to conquer. He will have us, Lewis says, he will have us even though we have shown that we prefer everything else in the world to him and come to him now simply because there is nothing better to be had. It is hardly a compliment to God that we will choose him as an alternative to hell, and yet even that he accepts because he is willing to forgive. He is willing you forgive but God I've broken your heart N not only have I not played by your rules not only have I not been obedient to the, the principles and the precepts by which you want me to live my life but I've broken the relationship that you have wanted to establish with me through love and even though we have been openly faithless He still forgives them. Even after Israel had done all that she had done, had showed that she, had pref that she really preferred every other deity on the face of the earth to the power and the person of Yahweh, God says, I will still forgive you. In fact, in the closing part of that third chapter, he talks about Israel coming breathlessly to God because they finally understand what's really involved here. This is nothing more or less than the reality of life. And what kind of life you and I choose to live. There was a rich man who lived in Chicago, who married a beautiful young woman. <clears throat> and they had a very happy life for a number of years, but then she began to be tormented by challenges within her own mind. She struggled, and as a result of her struggle, the husband, who was a man of some means, decided they would move to a new location. Maybe a fresh start would help her, but it didn't. In fact, it just sent her further and further into despair. He took her to the best doctors he could find all across the country of the United States, but she didn't seem to get much better. Finally, after he had spent thousands and thousands of dollars trying to find her some help, he came to the conclusion that maybe going back to the place where they began, to their first home, now some years removed, that might help. And so she and he moved back to the first house in which they had lived, in Chicago, as a married couple. And every night he would put her to bed, and she was always restless and always troubled and always stressed. But the first night they were back, she seemed a little bit easier in her spirit, and she fell asleep. The next night she seemed even better. The third night, about 3 a.m., she awakened and she looked over at it. And for the first time in many, many years, she made a coherent observation. She actually asked a question. She said, honey, I've been on a long journey. Where have you been? And he looked at her, realizing that maybe a breakthrough had just unfolded, and he said, I've been here waiting for you. 
to come back to me. Helmut Thielicke, years ago, had a book on the parables of, of Jesus. <clears throat> and the parable that we referred to earlier, the parable of the prodigal son from Luke's Gospel, Thielicke actually gave this title, The Waiting Father. And that's what Hosea is saying to the Israelites. God is waiting for you to acknowledge your need for him. God is waiting for you to return in repentance. He's waiting for us. And forgiveness is nothing more or less than the simple miracle of a new beginning. And that's what our Heavenly Father wants to give to each of us as we follow Him and turn to Him in faith and in trust and in love. One last lesson. We need to learn about the power of that love the love of God. Hosea bought her back after all that she had done to him, after all the promises she had broken, after the vows she had violated. Hosea's love overcame Hosea's hurt. And he brought her back. Although we don't know what happened to Gomer after this, my hunch is that Gomer was forever changed. I mean, think about it. Could you come face to face with that kind of love and somehow remain disinterested and disengaged and unattached? The love of God will change your life if you're willing to receive it. I talked to you last week about Frederick Buechner, <clears throat> whom we just lost a, a couple of weeks ago. In his own inimitable way, he talks about the story of Hosea. And I, I don't like to, to read generally uh, when, I, when I'm seeking to preach, but I, I have to share this because I can't be Buechner. Only Buechner can be Buechner. But this is his story about Hosea. <clears throat> Gomer was always good company, a little heavy with the lipstick, maybe a little less than choosy about men, uh, maybe a little too much booze, kind of loud, but great at a party, always good for a laugh. And then the prophet Hosea comes along wearing a sandwich board that reads, the end is at hand on one side and watch out on the other. But he and Gomer began to have a relationship. The first time he asked her to marry him, she thought he was kidding. The second time, she knew he was serious, but said, You're crazy, man. I don't want to spend my life with you. The third time he asked her, she said yes. Obviously, he wasn't exactly a swinger, but he had a kind face, and he was generous, and he wasn't all that crazier than anybody else. Besides, any fool on the face of the earth could see that he loved her. And give or take a little, she even loved him back for a bit. And they had these three children that Hosea named with queer names like, not pitied for God will no longer pity Israel now that she's gone to the dogs. And so that Hosea would be scoring a prophetic bullseye in absentia every time the child's name was called at school, but everyone around them could see the marriage wasn't going to work and it wasn't going to last, and it didn't. While Hosea was off hitting the sawdust trail, Gomer took to hitting as many night spots as she could squeeze into an evening. It almost killed him, of course, and then one night she didn't come home at all. He swore that this time he was through with her for keeps. That was it. But of course he wasn't. The man loved her. What can you say? 
When he finally found her, she was a slave, and he had to pay the owner plenty to get her back. She lost her front teeth and picked up some scars you had to see to believe, but Hosea had her back again, and that seemed to be all that mattered. He changed his sandwich, his sandwich board to read, God is love on one side and there's no end to it on the other. And then he stood on the street corner, Beekner says, and belted out this message. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? For I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. Beekner concludes by saying, Nobody can say how many converts old Hosea made, but one thing that is for sure, including Gomer's, there was never a dry eye in the house whenever he preached. In the brokenness of his own journey, Hosea learned a lesson. Actually, he learned a number of lessons. Sin is not just breaking a rule, it's breaking God's heart. But in spite of that, God wants to forgive us and live within us and love us. And that love will forever change us if we are just willing to receive it. I would just love to have been there as Hosea and Gomer went home from the slave market. Wouldn't you? I would just love to have been there. As the two of them strolled along, I imagine there was a few moments of kind of awkward silence. <clears throat> what do you say to a person who just did what Hosea did. But as they got closer to their old house, I imagine Gomer became increasingly distressed and anxious and finally just stopped and reached out with her hand and grabbed the arm of Hosea. My own sense is she looked up at him and she said, Hosea, I have to, I have to know something before we see the children. I, I have to know. I have to have the answer to just one question. Why? Why did you do this? Was it so that I could take care of the children? And I imagine Hosea responded, God forbid, Gomer, I never even thought of the kids. They have missed their mother more than you could ever know, but that's not why I bought you back. That's not why I got you out of slavery. And then I think the realization probably washed over Gomer, and she was unable to continue. And she just looked down, and her shoulders began to shake because she was weeping. And I think with the light of heaven in his eyes, Hosea reached down with his hands, and he lifted her face, and he looked into her eyes. And he said, Gomer, there's just one reason I did this. I love you. I love you so much. And our life together from now on is going to be different. But it's going to be because we're building this relationship on love. And then I think hand in hand they walk together to a joyful reunion that I would just love to have witnessed, but that would have been verbally indescribable. Gomer, Hosea, and the three kids with queer names. It's a love that will change your life. This love of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The story didn't end there, though, did it? Several hundred years later, another came speaking of God's love. He, too, bought us back from the land of broken promises and broken dreams and broken relationships. 
He bought us back, not with a homer and a lethic of barley and 15 pieces of silver. He bought us back with his own blood. And that's a story for the ages. Could we with ink the ocean fill, were the skies a parchment made, every stalk on earth a quill, every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretch from sky to sky. Love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure, the saints and angels' song. It's a love that will change your life, but you've got to be open to it. It's not about being obedient to rules. It's about understanding that when we disobey God, we break his very heart. But we also understand through the message of his word that he is willing to forgive us. And we also know existentially, if we've ever received that love, that that love is life-changing and transformational in its impact. That's why I like old Hosea. He speaks to us about the depth of God's love. Pray with me. Father, thank you for the truth of your word and the way in which it touches us and changes us. May that word be written upon our hearts indelibly, permanently, forever and ever. May we learn with Hosea, Father, what sin really is. May we also learn, Father, how ready and willing and able you are to forgive us if we turn to you in repentance and faith. And, oh, Father, how desperately all of us need for our lives to be changed by your all-encompassing, overwhelming, transformational love. Thank you for loving us enough to send your only Son, to die for our sins. And we come today acknowledging together with gratitude, with thankfulness, with joy, our Lord Jesus paid it all that we might live. So in these closing moments, Father, may you your spirit superintend each thing that is done, every thought that, that is nurtured, every, 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 every moment of meditation. Help us to know what it is you want us to do in response to the truth of your scriptures. And if there are public decisions that need to be shared today, Father, even now would you prompt and encourage those individuals who need to make those decisions to be willing to come forward in courage, in faith, in trust, in love, and to say yes to your will for their lives. Thank you for this church family, for the way in which it loves you and loves this world in which you have placed this church family to serve and to share Christ. May what we do in these closing moments honor Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Our